In today's video, we are going to attempt to peer into just how common the experience of prophantasia truly is. Let's take a look. Meow. Okay, welcome back to Hey Fantasia Meow. My name is Alec. I'm helping people here to visualize deeper or visualize more strongly, or if you don't visualize at all, to, you know, start visualizing for the first time. So last week we talked about prophantasia, the experience of prophantasia, and that was the first time I really tried to put the experience in a video form to give an example of what it actually looks like to have a prophantasic experience. In this week's video, I want to start taking a look at a survey that I've been running for the past year to try to get a general idea of just how common prophantasia actually is uh, as an experience. And the numbers might surprise us. Okay, so since April 2020, almost exactly a year ago actually, I launched a survey back then that was attempting to measure just how uh, many people were experiencing that, that experience of prophantasia that we outlined last week. So the way I set the survey up is first the participants ran through the VMSQ or the Vividness of Mental Census Questionnaire. That's a custom questionnaire that I created largely based on the VVIQ. Uh, I just tried to improve the process and bring some other mental senses into it, okay? So first of all, people were doing that. Well, very first step actually, let me backtrack, was to report whether they self-classified as uh, somebody experiencing aphantasia, somebody experiencing hypophantasia, common fantasia, or hyperphantasia. Okay, so four categories. And then they went through the VMSQ, and I did it like that to see in the numbers if their numbers did indeed reflect the category that they had self-reported themselves in. So that part of the questionnaire measured mind's eye activity and then some of the presence of the other mental senses as well. So after they were done with that part, then I attempted to clarify as best I could in writing and, you know, images on the questionnaire. I attempted to qu clarify what to expect going into the prophantasia section of the survey. So the way that that looked is, you know, I gave testers uh, something to compare prophantasia to, which is I used uh, after images. So that I instructed them to stare at an X on the screen and then close their eyes, and if they could still see it in the after image on the blackness of their eyelids, then that was pretty close to what a prophantasia experience is like. Trying to make the distinction that it's not up here that they're seeing this, it's actually out in front of them in their visual field, right? But that being said, I didn't have one-on-one -on -one contact with these people, so I'm not entirely sure, and there wasn't any real way for me to be sure if they fully understood the difference between mind's eye visualization and projected imagery. But we'll talk about that at the end. It's just a pitfall of this whole thing. Okay, so following that section, showing them after images, then they were instructed to try to project the image of a red star out into their visual field, just like an after image. Okay, and they tried that for about 20 seconds and then they're instructed to move on. Directly following that, I showed them the image that we put up last week actually, and here it is again of the red star test, asking people to, okay, now rate on the scale of, of one to six, how vivid you were able to project that star. And that's the entire process that I walk people through. It's actually still live on my website. So if you want to check it out or go participate, click the link in the description, have fun. So all in all, we're looking at 50 individuals across the three categories that we're focusing on, which is hypophantasia, common fantasia, and hyperphantasia. There were 13 people that self-described themselves as hypophantasic. There were 12 that self-described themselves as common fantasic. And then there were 25 that described themselves as hyperphantasic. Okay, so now after breaking all this down and finding averages on who's actually reporting being able to project, uh, let's look at um, people reporting either uh, a two or greater, okay, on that scale of one to six, like the Red Star test showed. 64, now this is a big number. I was not expecting this, quite honestly. 64% of them reported something uh, greater than nothing, right? So that means 64% reported being able to project at least something into the black space. That number is way, way higher than I thought it was going to be. Okay, but if we look at the numbers that, let's say, you know, we take uh, image four or greater, well, only 32% of people reported something four or greater. And, you know, two, uh, three to one is, is not that strong of projection imagery at all. 
Now let's break these down a little bit more. So out of people that describe themselves as hyperphantasic, 60% uh, of those people reported being able to see greater than a four on their surveys, which is still crazy high. And if we take a look at the other two categories, hypophantasic and common phantasic, well, only 24% of them reported either a image four or greater. So it's a lot less in those camps than it is in hyperphantasia. So most of that number, that 64% number of total projectors, right? Uh, we could basically um, give credit to the hyperphantasics for that. But this leads us to the last thing we got to talk about here. And that's the idea that I don't necessarily trust these numbers quite yet. I think they can work as like a general idea of how many people may be projecting images like this. But I can't, like I said, I can't guard in this process since it's only done over a Google form, right? I can't guard in the process fully against people misunderstanding what the experience of prophantasia is like. And I know for a lot of hyperphantasics, when I've talked with them one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes they have such vivid mental imagery activity going on that it's hard for them to distinguish if they actually see it or not. And then after about 10 minutes of really dissecting the process with them, they're like, oh no, I don't actually hallucinate anything. And I'm like, oh well, it's hard to pin down, you know? So those are the pitfalls that hyperphantasics were absolutely weighing the results in a certain direction, of course, because there were more of them that uh, tested through and then, you know, more of them put number sixes um, as what they were projecting. And then also not being able to guard against misunderstandings where some of them may actually not be projecting images, but, you know, are, are misunderstanding the process or something like that. Um, and it, according to their answers, I asked them to put a note if they had any thoughts afterwards. And according to some of those answers, I, I could kind of gather that some of them didn't quite grasp what was being asked there. So that's something to keep into account. But for now, I'd like to make an initial conclusion that it's possible that around 30% of visualizers in general, whether they're hypophantasic or hyperphantasic, wherever they rest, of visualizers in general are able to project some sort of imagery, okay? And that number is actually way higher than I used to think it was, I, I used to think it was more around the lines of like, I don't know, maybe five, 10% of hyperphantasics only, which are already a minority in the population. Um, and so, of course, this is not a concrete number. This is just a general idea to start with. Uh, next, I need to refine the process of being able to demonstrate what prophantasia is like so I know as best as possible that people understand what to expect from the experience or what to expect when they're filling out the survey. And so that's kind of the next step is to refine these numbers, to find some more concrete examples and, and you know, refine the whole process a little bit. But if that turns out to be the case, that indeed 30% of visualizers are able to project images, whew, that's a lot higher than I thought, you know? Um, and that tells me that prophantasia may be the experience of prophantasia may be a lot more common than we had initially thought. So interesting, very interesting. Part of me, you know, with sort of like a, a bias coming into the numbers, I was like, no, this can't be. This is like so different than what I thought it was. But hey, that's science, right? You got to report on stuff, even if it breaks your bias about what you expect the answer to be. So. So that's it for today. Next week, we're going to be talking about the spectrum of prophantasia and the different types of things you can start to experience and di diving into that quite a bit more. So make sure you jump on my website, www.aphantasiameow.com. I offer a three, free 30 minutes to anybody that wants it. So if you'd like to chat with me, like to see if some of my programs might work, or you just like to get some, you know, pointed in the right direction, please book a free call with me down in the description. Visit my website, drop me a line. And other than that, make sure you subscribe to the channel. I'm going to have a lot more content like this coming out, different numbers, different things we're going to start talking about, and actually some announcements in the next couple months that I'm going to be making, okay? So ring the bell. That'll let you know when I upload a new video. Otherwise, you'll just, it'll just go into the ether of, the rest of your hundreds of subscriptions like mine usually do unless I ring the bell for somebody else. So drop a like, comment too. I'd love to hear your opinion uh, about if you are a visualizer, if you're not a visualizer, um, if you experience aphantasia, or if you've had an experience of prophantasia and how common you may think it is, or you know if you've ever had a prophantasic experience. Drop a comment, drop a like, and I'll see you next time. Okay.